Hey everyone, I'm Acidus. Um, thank you. Um, so I, I'm talking today about spy software in general. Um, I will be open and, and frank. I was writing this a while because I thought about going to DEF CON and I've kind of put the project on hold. I haven't touched it in several months. Um, but I opened it up yesterday and it still <laughs> worked. So um, uh, I, I'm working on some other projects. Uh, I wanted to pimp those for a second. Uh, I'm the founder and main developer of a program called Stripe Snoop. It was on Slashdot a few months back. Um, that does all sorts of like mag stripe reading and uh, almost writing the alpha right now. I've got kind of a primitive writer working. Um, so that's a cool thing. You guys should check it out. That's stripesnoop.sourceforge.net. Um, you guys also have probably seen me talk about Spectrosoft. In fact, the last time I ever talked about Spectrosoft was at Interzone 2. And well, I, I kind of got sued at Interzone 2 and my speech went like crap because I got served like 15 minutes before I was supposed to give my Spectrosoft talk. And uh, I was totally frazzled. Um, the slides like were dying. My program core dumps, nothing worked. Needless to say, I've done actually a good bit of work since Interzone 2 on this. Uh, so you guys should like it. We're going to do a demo. Um, there's a SourceForge project that does all this stuff. Uh, I also tend to talk a lot. So shout out your questions at me. I don't care. Sound good? Good? I'd like it a live audience too, though. Come on. Good? All right. Excellent. Great. Why do you have the wrong date? Is it not the 22nd? It is, but it's not August. Oh, my God. <laughs> no. no, no, I did it. Just pretend that's a 10. Okay, so I'm going to start out with a nice legal disclaimer. Spectrosoft, or Spectre is a trademark of Spectrosoft, and there is no affiliation between myself, uh, most significant Bit Labs, which is kind of a pseudo LLC company I've started to do all sorts of crazy stuff. Actually, Stripe Snoop has been licensed by a couple of people who make point of sale devices, so I'm making money. You can make money in open source software. Uh, please note that this is all as is. Don't do this. This, this is this is purely for information purposes only, and everything done preparing for this. Uh, and all the reverse engineering I did was for the sole purpose of writing interoperable software, uh, so please don't send the DMCA Nazis after me. Okay, I'm going to give a quick interview over spy software in general, what the history is, and how it's just getting nastier. Um, we're going to talk about the number one speller, or the, yeah, I'm already getting tongue-tied. The, the number one selling piece of spy software in the world is something called Spectre. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to show how much of a bastard it is, how hard it is to find it, uh, detect it, and destroy it. We're going to show how to disable it. I'm going to show you a demo of SpectreSoft working. Uh, then I'm going to explain how Spectre actually does what it does, how it stores the information. We're going to talk about the header, the index, the data entries. We're going to show some advanced techniques. And then I'm going to show you the software that reverse engineers Spectre. Okay, so let's get this ball rolling. Uh, what is spy monitoring software? Okay, well this is basically software that collects some type of personal information. Um, some states require that the user is notified. A lot of times, um, so you know, if you're on hold, I was having to pay my wireless bill yesterday, which by the way, AT&T sucks. Um, anyway, you, you know, you, thank you. You get those calls that say, you know, this call is, you know, maybe recorded for monitoring purposes. Okay, yeah, they can train telemarketers to be even bigger pricks, whatever. It's the same thing. Some laws will require that if monitoring software is installed on a piece of, uh, on a machine, that a little notice pops up and says, hey, you're being monitored. Um, some states don't. Georgia does not. Uh, I worked at a company while I was co-op, and they used SpectreSoft, and I kind of stumbled upon it. And then I was like, oh, this is interesting. Um, so like I said, this is just software that sits there, captures personal information. Normally, it is um, screenshots, key logs. Uh, they've gotten substantially more advanced in the last year. Um, they can grab um, your pop messages going in and out. They grab instant messages. And there's a lot more reporting capabilities. Before, it was simply grab the screen, grab the uh, keyboard, and let's dump it to a file and report it. It has much uh, more advanced reporting capabilities. It will you know, actually give you a history of all your AIM conversations, give you kind of nice little um, trees showing everything. It's pretty scary. Um, there are several examples of spy software. Uh, commercialized, you've got Spectre, uh, which is made by Spectre Stoff. You have eBlaster, which is kind of a, a light version of Spectre. It's also made by them. Spy Agent, there are lots of others. And then there are kind of hackers. Um, Sub7 is a server, is a, is a Trojan, but it does basically what spy software does. Netbus. Uh, Netbus is a nasty one, and it's very interesting. Spectre is actually Netbus. 
the versions 1.0 through um, versions 3 of Spectre is actually Netbus with some extra stuff on it. There's a company selling you a Trojan, and they're making money off of it. If I wrote, if I had written um, Netbus, I would have been really pissed. Though I guess, I, I mean, if you're infecting someone with Netbus, I guess you kind of have to license that under the GPL because, you know, hey, here's the source code and here's what you just got screwed with. Okay, so what is Spectre? Um, it's the number one spy monitoring software in the world. Uh, originally started as a Netbus Trojan, like I said, and unfortunately current events have just rapidly uh, caused its adoption. Um, I first got interested in Spectre, like I said, I found it at my uh, co-op office, but um, I, I was watching 2020. Uh, it was like in t the fall of 2002, so right a long time ago, I guess. In fact, I, I came up and gave uh, talked at Freaknik 6, first time I actually came up to Nashville then. Uh, and it was essentially a 2020 story. Uh, they might as well have just called it Protect Your Children. Because that's what it all was about. It was about like, oh, let's put GPS monitoring stuff in our kids' cars to make sure they're not speeding. And, um, you know, here's how to enable the V-chip on all of your televisions. And um, we need to monitor their use on the Internet because God knows they're talking to pedophiles while making a nuclear bomb. You know, that's what they're trying to do. It, it was crazy. It was totally trying to play on people's fears. Um, and unfortunately, it's worked. I mean, uh, Benjamin Franklin has a really good quote that says, um, people who are willing to sacrifice uh, privacy for security deserve neither privacy nor security. Uh, and unfortunately, the current trend in our country is, you know, protect me, protect me. I will give you anything you want if you just make me feel safe. Uh, and Spectre has a real nice gig because they make you feel safe and they get 50 bucks out of it. Yeah, yeah, doesn't it? So okay, Spectre's features. This is actually, I have to confess, or I have to confess, it's a nifty ass program. I mean, I completely hate it, but I can admire the, the skill involved. It's kind of like with virus writers. I mean, I don't like viruses, but I have to admire, it's pretty cool to be able to own a Windows box in 2K of code. Um, okay, so it has God's own stealth. This thing is really, really, really damn hard to detect. Um, it has passworded access to it, so even when you do detect it, you have to crack a password to even get at the stuff. Um, takes screenshots, it captures P2P transactions, it keeps a nice log of all the files you're trading on um, fast track, all the major P2P networks. It uh, doesn't do BitTorrent yet. Um, uh, what programs you're using keeps a list of what uh, programs were run and for how long uh, and whether they had focus. Um, uh, uh, keystrokes, uh, uh, URLs, email, uh, not only pop but it'll also um, be able to tell that you're using like Hotmail or Yahoo and it'll stick those into its nice little email thing. Has a really nice front end too. In fact, let's take a look at it. This is what it looks like. Um, it's got these nice little fun tabs where you click email and you can get a big list and summary. I mean, it, it almost looks like a mail client. It gives you a list of websites. It'll actually give you a um, preview of what that site was looking at at the time. Chat, aim, keystrokes, programs, peer-to-peer, -peer, and snapshots. It's neat, it actually runs the uh, screen captures it takes, kind of like a primitive movie. So, like I said, it has God's own stealth. I had a bitch of a time trying to figure out this thing when it was running in stealth. You know, look at add-remove programs, it's not there. I mean, you try, have to try the obvious stuff. Do control alt delete look in the uh, process tree. I mean, granted, you're not gonna see it in, you know, programs, but you figure, yeah, I can find the process. No, it's not in processes either. Try to do process viewers to find cloaked processes. Not there. It's tricky, it actually, is mainly implemented by two DLLs, and they hook Explorer EXE right when the machine boots, and so all of your programs are now, uh, pretty much it grabs Explorer EXE, and then every process Explorer spawns also gets hooked, so, I'm sorry? Yeah, you can, you can, you can uh, in fact, l uh, list DLLs gives you a really good idea of what which programs are hooking it, and it tells you um, what functions inside it are being called, which was a nice way to reverse engineer it. Okay, so detecting it, here are the obvious sides. Uh, you can run it in stealth mode or not stealth mode. If it's not running in stealth mode, it's pretty damn easy. You know, if you see a shortcut on your desktop that says Spectre, <laughs> with the guy, you know, with the glasses, who's watching you, that's, that's a pretty good indication you're being watched. Um, this nifty little red square, which I'm like, why the hell is this a red square? And they're like, in their nice little help manual, um, they're just like, oh, the red square is to remind you of, you know, a VCR recording. I'm like, hmm, I guess it does kind of look like a VCR recording. And also, if you see Spectre actually in your start menu, that also is an indication that you are being monitored. Okay, so let's try to detect this in stealth mode. Uh, it was interesting, when I was doing an install, I was using an older version here, um, Spectre 2.2. 
um, I was able to find the um, things that actually installed um, by just doing, you know, doing a directory dump before and after the install, figure out what changed. Um, so, you know, it added some entries. Uh, here are two nasty uh, DLLs, um, net kernel and uh, net kernel uh, HM, which is the hardware manager. Um, it's got some help files. Uh, this is the front end that gets launched. And then this web E bot, I haven't been able to figure out what it is yet. I think it's just a helper module. Um, I haven't really been looking at 2.2. This is, like I said, an older version. Okay, um, so detecting in stealth mode. Uh, list DLLs, which you can get from System Internals. I think it's systeminternals.com. They have a lot of great programs. I highly, highly recommend them. Um, they've got a nice little thing that'll let you run um, list DLLs and see what things have hooked what programs. Uh, and here you can very cleanly see in Explorer EXE that uh, net uh, 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 NL DLL and uh, HM DLL. Those are the two that Spectre uses. Okay. So here's another great thing. I started thinking, wait a minute, so SpectreSoft, let's assume it's capturing, if it's doing screen captures, it's got to write these to disks. You can actually, inside SpectreSoft, set the interval. So an interesting sli side channel is you can just pop open a system manager uh, and say, okay, let me watch the disk, ac disk access. If you're not running anything and you've pretty much removed everything, they're not doing SETI at home or something, it's very plain to see every five seconds there's this nice little peak. Uh, and in fact, it, if you can see on there, it says 12K. Uh, I was running this, I think, at 1024 by 768 at like 16-bit color depth. And if you take a screenshot of that and use and, and make it a ping file, because they actually use Zlib, I'll talk about that in a second, for compression, it's exactly that size. So they're basically just writing ping images to disk um, every five seconds. Uh, there actually is a phone home correspondent uh, part of it. Um, it appears to be just for product registration and making sure that keys aren't floating around. Um, by the way, I did all of this with a demo. It was the demoed version, and I'm sticking with that. <laughs> so a fun way to disable this, you know, if you're using uh, an older 98 machine, uh, you can use msconfig and, or, M, or the registry editor. Uh, here in msconfig, you can see uh, webebot. Like I said, that was the loader, the helper function, which kind of um, uh, loads the GUI up. You can see that. That also is what gives you down here in the taskbar your nice little thing. This is, in fact, Linux. I know it kind of looks like XP, but I don't suck, I promise. Okay. Um, and then also right in here in... Um, I don't really want to read this registry key because they are long, but basically in uh, current version run, so you can see what's starting, you can see this nice little entry for it to boot. So yeah, hack your registry, that's always fun. Um, any questions so far? Are you guys alive? Yes. Oh, you better believe they're greasing some palms. Yeah, I mean it. Oh, I'm sorry. the The question was the question was um, do antivirus um, do antivirus companies how come they're not detecting it if, if its core was originally the Netless Pro Trojan, even though now it's some type of commercial product? Uh, I imagine during the time uh, Spectre was paying them. I mean, you guys have to understand the spy software. I checked; they had like revenues of it was like. I don't remember his gross or net. We're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. This space is huge. Uh, and it's only getting bigger. In fact, the, the big kind of plights that are happening now are adware and spyware are the big things. I mean, viruses, we have kind of a reactionary um, attack to them. You know, Windows patches them eventually, and uh, you update your definitions. So we have a way to kind of deal with them. We don't really have a way to deal with spy software and adware. We're still trying to cope with that. Yes. It could be. I mean, if, if your product is based on a virus and you're making money off it, you're going to pay the people who try to find the viruses to not find your product. Especially because the whole, I mean, this thing, granted, there's a little notice that will say, hi, I am 
you know, I am, uh, you're being monitored, but uh, these guys get by with it being stealth. The whole way these programs work, the whole way they make money is they're able to tell uh, employers, you know, hey, you can keep your employees in line by, you know, making them think Big Brother is always watching them. Um, I, I'll go off on a little side channel because I got a little bit of time here. Um, this whole idea pisses me off, and that was the main reason why. I tend to get involved with things that piss me off. Blackboard, they pissed me off. And they screwed me, but they pissed me off. Spectrosoft pisses me off because they market this as a, it's kind of this, I don't want to go off on a rant here, you know, Dennis Miller style, but it, <laughs> so like the complete trend in American parenting is it's not my fucking problem. Someone else is going to raise my kids. I'm not going to teach my kids to not go to the R-rated movie. It's the movie theater's job to make sure my kid doesn't go to the R-rated movie. It's not my responsibility to teach my kid that, you know, Go, taking a shotgun to a school and shooting people is wrong. It's Doom's fault. It's these people's fault. Orrin fucking Hatch, you know, wants to, you know, have... Fuck Orrin Hatch. That was the best part of your speech, by the way. Fuck Orrin Hatch. Uh, you know, it, it's completely wrong. And this entire company that is saying, you know, keep your, you know, children in line, you know, monitor them. I'd say, why don't you fucking get away from your damn career and sit down with your kids for a half an hour a day, and they're not going to be doing the shit that this company is telling you they're trying to prevent. So these guys piss me off. So that's basically why I decided, you know, I want to find a way to make their products completely ineffective. And the way you make it ineffective is you let people know they're being monitored. You give them tools so they can detect it. Then you let them corrupt what's being monitored. Meaning if, if you can, at the end of the day, look at a big record of what all your employees did, but I totally have access to change that database too, it's worthless because when you look at my computer, you're going to see I was browsing the ACLU website all day. Now, that wasn't what I was doing, but that's what you're going to see. Um, so my whole goal is to basically make them ineffective. Um, and so, all right. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Okay. I don't know. I mean, uh, they are. Okay, so the uh, he was asking. E Blaster just came out with a new version, and it's supposed to be harder to detect. And you know, is it more virus-like? And blah blah blah. I mean, they've pretty much gone legit now. The the core, you know, doing a nice strings on their early versions versus their later versions. It's pretty easy to tell. They pretty much abandoned most of their original Netbus core. Um, I, I actually, I'm looking at my time, and I, I only have about 40 minutes left, and I do have a lot to cover, so I'm going to try to, like, whip through. If you've got something really important, feel free to shout out. Okay. Uh, oh, well, I was going to do the demonstration of SpectreSoft, except for I'm in Linux, and I don't really want to take the time to pop into Windows, but I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, let me pop up here, and I'll show you this GUI and give you kind of a little better uh, idea of what exactly it is that they're doing. Um, like I said, you have to excuse me, I have an old slow laptop. Um, so, uh, Spectre is really simple. They, the, the program basically um, sits down in your taskbar, whatever, it hooks Explore. Every time you do something, it records it. Now, it records it into these special type of files called SPT files, which is for Spectre. Um, and it has some interesting information. So I kind of thought of as a thought experiment what type of information has to go into these things? Because the, remember, the first step is um, being able to read them. We want to see what was recorded. Uh, and also disable Spectre, which we talked about. Uh, actually, I'm going to change my mind and just go down uh, and start talking more about the SPT files. Um, so these SPT files are really kind of having Spectre by the ball, so to speak. I mean, if you can corrupt these things, you completely destroy their product because an employee, if they can't trust what uh, Spectre is reporting to them, they're not going to pay the ass load of money to Spectre to, uh, to do the thing. Okay, demonstration. I'm not going to do a demo. Um, if you guys would like to see a demo, come see me afterwards. Um, I recently reloaded this laptop, and so I have to reinstall it, and it'll be a giant pain in the butt. Okay, so leveling the playing field. You know, let's, they, they seem to have a lot of balls in their court. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not against corporations trying to keep their employees honest. You know, when I was co-op, there was a guy who was like two cubicles over me named Bill Colt, and he used to play StarCraft all day. In fact, the other co-ops and I had a little game which was give Bill a heart attack, in which case, you know, we would sneak up kind of towards his cube, 
And so they'd just be like, oh, hey, Jim, Reed, how you doing? Which was our boss's name. And you would, you would frantically hear Bill alt-tabbing and, like, you know, straightening up and, you know, pretending that he, he wasn't playing StarCraft. Um, Bill should have been fired, and he was fired because, well, they found lots of porn on his computer. But <laughs> that's another story for another day. Um, so I just want to clear the record. I'm not against corporations keeping employees honest. I just think the way Spectre is trying to market their product and the way they're pretty much preying on people's fears is very wrong. Okay, so uh, the SPT files store all the captured content, everything. They use compression to reduce the size. They hold the basic information about the captured content, such as its type and duration and things like that. So a Spectre or SPT file consists of a couple of things. You've got a header in red. This is a fixed length. It gives you some information about how many different types of captured items there are in the file. And by a captured item, I'm meaning a screenshot or a uh, application name or a little bit of text or an email. Um, it, like I said, it has a magic number, start and stop time, the location of the index. Now this is interesting. The index is in purple. And it's an index of X number of entries describing the data, what type of data it is and where it's stored. So if you can, uh, oh, and then I'm sorry, then you have X data blocks. And each one of these are compressed with the deflate compression algorithm. This is, if you guys have ever heard of Zlib, uh, it's what uh, gzip uses. It's a free uh, open implementation. It's actually, excuse me, excellent compression algorithm. Um, and it's lossless, which is great, and which is exactly why they use it. Um, so each one of these blue things represents a hunk of data. And so here's some static data, and inside this there's a pointer that says, hey, here's where the index is. And then the index consists of a number of fixed entries. I believe they're 36 bytes that contain, hey, here's some information about it, and here's a pointer back to where in the file each one is. Now, if you think about the way SpectreSoft works, this makes sense. Because you basically start the program, in which case you have some certain type of information you know, such as the start time, some other information. And basically, every five seconds or so, whatever, you're doing a capture, compressing it, and just appending it to the file. So blue, 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 blue. And then when Spectre actually, we'll talk about how to force Spectre to actually write this to the disk. Uh, when it does that, it just tallies everything it's already written, makes this nice little index, writes it, and then updates the table in the header. Make sense? It's pretty good. Okay. Uh, oh, wow, I think I just did this. So header is created when reporting re the recording starts. It's lightly populated. Each new capture is appended to the file, and the index is in, in memory is updated. When recording stop, the header is uh, completed, and the index is written, to, er, and the index and the header and everything is all written to disk. Okay, so uh, content is saved to one SPT file until Spectre stops you unload it, or you change the screen dimensions. That's interesting. So up in this red thing, they actually kind of keep, hey, here are what the screen dimensions are, and here's the color depth. That helps Spectre uh, malloc memory ahead of time for each one of these buffers. So if you actually change the screen resolutions, you force it to write one of these files to disk. So for example, if you're being monitored at work and you know it and you want to change it before you leave it today, you change your resolution, your screen resolution, and you force the SPT file to be written to your disk, and now you can modify the SPT file to have whatever you want in it. So, uh, multiple SPT files are in this one secret directory, uh, and they have, a, they have um, a field inside the header that kind of lets it know uh, what the order is. So if you've got five SPT files, um, they kind of keep track and let you kind of have one giant capture file. Okay, so this is a quick example of what the header looks like. Um, the header holds a magic number, which kind of identifies it. Hey, this is an SPT file. Holds the screen dimensions, the start and stop times, as well as information about the location and size of the index. So um, right here, this is the magic number, which translates to ZZTA. Um, and then the SPT file number at uh, offset of 10. This right here says one, so this is the first file of the larger SPT capture. So that's spanned over multiple files. Um, okay. Okay, so we've got uh, start time, start time and stop time, which are there. Uh, these are recorded in 32-bit C time, so you can use the uh, C.h or uh, C time.h library to just read them. Real simple. Uh, in, in this particular instance, I started in February uh, 19, 2004, and ended a little later, three minutes later. Okay, and then here we see our screen dimensions, which are uh, 1024 by 768, uh, and those are at offsets 54 and 58 hex. And then, ah, here, now we're getting to the good stuff. This basically tells you 
all the way at the end of the file, this is where the index is. So location of the index, and it's extremely important because it points you to the index, which then tells you how to parse the rest of the file. Uh, there's some other fun information here. It tells you the number of indexes, tells you the compressed size of the index, and the size of the uncompressed index. And again, this is just for um, uh, performance reasons. They're having to do a lot of this really fast, and they don't want the user to be aware that uh, Spectre is even running. So they have to do a lot of, hey, let me tell you ahead of time what the size will be so you can malloc it. Because they try to do as much in memory as they can. Anyone have any questions so far? Excellent. Okay, so header info uh, points us down to the index, and this is compressed. This is the first part of it that is actually compressed. And it contains X number of 32 byte entries describing the size, location, and type of all captured content. Um, oh, okay, so this is what one of them looks like. It's nasty, but these uh, 36 bytes tell us everything we need to know to reconstruct the content. It even has this really neat uh, caching feature, which I'll tell you about. So let's go ahead and try to figure out what this is. Um, that is what it ends up looking like when you, so this right here, 36 bytes, ends up translating to one of these. This is a giant uh, SBT file, it's about a meg long, has something like three minutes worth of screenshots, yet it's only a meg, so that gives you a good idea how, how they're good their compression is. Um, this just tells you the time, uh, date stamp, tells you the location inside the file where it is. Uh, I'll get into what the types mean, but this just identifies this as um, parts of a picture. Uh, tells you the compressed length, the actual length, which piece of the picture it is. I'll get into that in a second. And also hash, which is really cool. I'll get into that in a second, too. So these indexes point back to the data. Uh, they basically can, and then these things themselves actually aren't just raw data. You won't directly be pointing to, you know, like, you know, random text from an email conversation. It actually points to something that has a very small header. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, each one of these blocks is compressed. When you uncompress them, you get some type of header. It's a very simple header. For example, if you had, um, if one of these was a uh, part of a screen, oh, here's my advanced features. So if one of those was part of a screen, um, let me just go back one more. Um, so if one of these was part of a screen, like this one is, it says pieces, um, when you actually go to that part of the file and decrypt it, the header will be something very simple to say, hey, here's the X component, here's the Y component, and you know, here are the dimensions of this little part. Uh, Spectre actually divides pictures up into little pieces, as you see right here. Spectre kind of took one out of the uh, MPEG playbook. Uh, MPEG is the motion picture experts group, whatever. They do all sorts of codes, or all sorts of standards, et cetera. But MPEG, one of the ways it works is it's not let's take each frame and try to compress it. It's let's take each frame, divide it into a grid, and only save what changes. Spectre does the same thing. They divide the screen into 16 pieces, um, and they say, you know, oh, only this part changed. Uh, or as I'm, you know, let's say I'm typing in my address bar. Only these two things are saved, or only these two things are changing. So it's only compressing and writing those to disk. Uh, at the front of those um, blue entries, when I was talking about like X and Y, so like this one would say, oh, the X and X is zero. This is like 1024, so that divided by four. That's what this length is this, and so this one, you know, would be at a different XY coordinate. So it's how it reconstructs the screen. Um, so that's neat. It, it actually drastically, regular people just browsing desktops or working on Word documents, you get a huge reduction in the amount of data you actually have to store and compress. Um, so here's a nice nifty advanced feature. Um, it's actually over here. They have a cache. Um, so every element Spectre captures, it kind of keeps a running list. Uh, I haven't figured out what the hashing function is yet. You don't need to know what the hashing function is. You can give it a file without any hashes. It'll still work okay. Um, but basically, it runs it through some type of hashing function, and it generates a 32-bit hash. Um, and then, if Spectre is um, compressing another piece of captured data, it looks to see if the hashes are the same. If so, it says, you know what? There's no point in me trying to write this to disk. I will just simply write a pointer to the previous one. And that's exactly what this is doing here. Um, this is the hash, and then these are picture pieces. Uh, and this is saying, you know what? Uh, this little X1 is, signifies a flag, meaning the number that follows is not, in fact, a hash value. It is a pointer to the previous piece you captured. So this is saying, go to, you know, 1F, the, the 1F F -th piece that you uh, compressed, and you're going to use that here instead. And in fact, if, if you look over here where it says, um, 
location. This and this, they kind of occupy the same location in the file. That's because they don't really reference a file. They actually say, mm, you know what, go to this entry in the index, and that's what we're talking about. And then again here, we go ahead and resume with hashes again. So that also drastically reduces the amount of space, especially if you keep going to Google a lot. Google's my home page, and so, wow, there, every time it does that, that's an entire image it doesn't have to store. So, any questions? You guys doing good? Okay. Let's do some demonstrations of this. So, my original plan was to, you know, bust out into Windows and show you Spectre uh, and capture some stuff um, and then actually show you what it looked like. Uh, unfortunately, I can't do that, but what I can do is show you a previous thing. So, uh, we have some, so let me go here, SPT. Uh, all of this is available online at my website, which is www.yak.net slash acidus. Um, and let me make sure this is the right place. Okay, great. So this um, here, oh, you can't really see it. There's a mega SPT file right here, which has all those screen captures over three minutes that I was talking about. Um, the, the program right here is actually a rather simple version of it. Uh, and basically what I'm going to do, go ahead. Uh, the mega file, actually this is a really interesting thing. So uh, it is only... 1.1 uh, megs. So this will be interesting because you're going to see how, how freaking large it was. Um, okay, so we're going to run SPT, which is our uh, SPT reader. I'm going to give it an input file of mega.spt. Okay, so goes ahead, pop some stuff up here. It says file to read, found the signature, gathering information, found the screen resolutions, found where the uh, index was located at, uh, tells you there are th uh, 381 pieces of captured data. Now, that sounds like a lot, but keep in mind, every single screen capture is 16 pieces, if it's not referencing previous pieces. Um, goes ahead and says, uh, compressed length, found the uncompressed length, calling decode. So it gives us a nice summary. This particular picture, c or this particular file contained 42 captures. Has seven application names, 35 screenshots, no key logs. Uh, and then it went through, like I said, slow laptop, but it finished decompressing everything. So let's actually look at what that was. Um, it gives me a nice little output directory. Um, and damn, we've got a lot of bitmaps that we exported to. Um, there's also some things over here that would show key log. There aren't any key logs, so this is actually a blank file. Um, I'll show you this parsed index that I was talking about. Um, the code is heavily commented. I highly encourage people to do this. Like I said, I'm a college student. I'm graduating in the spring. And so my time has been kind of divided between school and Stripe Snoop recently. I haven't been able to work on this as much as I'd like. So I totally want help on this. Um, I've got, like I said, I've got the reader working. And the thing that actually lets you modify and inject, you can actually write your own SPT files. And Stripe Snoop, and uh, excuse me, Spectre parses those suckers right away. And so I actually have gotten it. So I can load an SPT file in, and you'll see me browsing the ACLU website. What I'd like to do is kind of selective editing, where you can say, here's what an SPT file is. I want to insert, inject into here. Um, this is what the output looks like. This is what you saw before. Uh, and here's some nice little divides. It says capture one, capture two, capture three. This is really cool because it'll show you what I'm talking about with that MPEG stuff. So the first capture was a screenshot. Um, we see that it is, uh, that's what these little one, two, one, two, those signify screenshot. It tells us the compressed length. Now this is interesting, it shows us pieces one or zero through F. Those were the 16 divisions of the screen we were talking about. Um, next capture, capture number one. Oh, you'll also notice this is the time date stamp, 32 bit um, C time value. Uh, here you have a slightly different one than up here. Actually, I'm sorry, this is because it's the application name that was using. This is actually the same. Here you'll see this is a different one. This was at uh, E1B. This was at E51. So this was taken 30 seconds later. Um, here we see a picture. Here, because of the 1, 2, 1, 2, we also see this was a picture. However, this has 16 entries, and this only has 5 entries. And, there is, and you'll also see pieces. It's only recording piece 0, 1, 2, 3, and C. So those are the only things that changed. I'll actually show you what those pictures were. 
I also need to design a better interface because right now it spits out um, bitmaps and Stank, you were asking me, you know, how big that file was. Those bitmaps are gigantic. So, disk usage. Uh, 53 megs. 53 megs worth of bitmaps ejected from one meg worth of compressed spectrum. I told you it's a damn nifty program. I have to admire the programming. Uh, and the funny thing is, is they, they, it's like they used open source against us twice. Hold on one second. They, um, they hacked the Netbus Trojan, and then they're using a free, you know, GPL compression library to do it too. Yes. Uh, no, each, each, whoa, each one of these, um, each one of these, I'm sorry, the question was, is there a hash on the overall uh, application? No, there aren't. Each one of these um, capture files, each one of these little parts, you'll see right here, it'll say um, the hash, each one of those has a hash. And so, I think actually I can scroll down and show you um, where it goes, ah, excellent, right here. So, and I will actually go to the screenshots and I'll let you see how the screens don't change. Here we got a capture number 12, so this is great because we can go look at bitmap number 12 and I can let you see how it referenced previous ones. We've got a full uh, picture, all 16, um, all 16 pieces uh, of the picture were captured. So it was a completely different screen looking than the previous one. However, I had done this uh, before, meaning that the, f the previous screenshot was not the same. However, many, many, many screenshots ago, parts of that original screenshot are in the new screenshot. So right here, right here, right here, and here, it just went ahead and wrote references to 1B, 1C, 1F, uh, and 2.0. So it's referencing way back up here. Oh, this is, uh, I used to have it where it would spit out next to here what number it is, but it's actually referencing some of these original ones. And I'll show you in the screenshot, I actually visit google.com twice. And so that's what it's referencing. Yes. So what you're saying is from a forensic standpoint, it wouldn't be admissible in a court of law because there was not an overall uh, hash that defined the actual screenshots. Uh, oh, I, I'm sorry. I, should I leave the that. legal stuff to the lawyers. <laughs> well, basically, what you're saying is that any of this information can be modified, changed, whatever. Oh yes, yes. In fact, that's the entire point is I modify, change, and generally fuck the data up. Good um, job. Yes. Okay. So let's go ahead. Uh, all this stuff is dumped to the output directory, and I can regenerate this so you guys can actually see it spit these things out if you don't believe me. Ooh, that was loud. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go fit to window. It is fit to window. So let me minimize this so it's a little better. So here we see a screenshot of this is a Win98 system. Uh, and here you see kind of a, a nice screenshot. You see Spectre running down here. I've got PGP key, uh, some other stuff. So Spectre is running. And the first screenshot it took, obviously, was the Spectre program that I had open. Um, Uh, there's part of a screenshot, and you'll see sometimes Spectre will actually grab it while Windows is refreshing, so you'll get interesting artifacts like that from now and then. So here we see Google. Uh, you know, here's me browsing all sorts of stuff. There's Strix's website, which he helps me host, which is yak.net. You know, kind of browsing wrong. This one probably looks familiar. Uh, back to Yak. Uh, that's it, trying to parse inner zone threes. Um, me doing Where's stuff. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, well, we know we can hack this. We can inject Freaknik stuff into this, see? So, so we see all of these opening up Mozilla um, back at Google. It's kind of drawing these lines because um, GQ view doesn't really want to render. I could go full screen, but then we kind of lose the, uh, the names. So if I go back up here, um, I want people to be able to see that screens reference previous screens. Um, let's go back to this. Uh, this was capture zero. So capture zero was a picture. So that was this picture that got captured, first of all. Um, then we went ahead. Uh, this was right here is an application. Uh, an application, I think I actually spit out a list of application names. Mm, no, probably not with this one. Um, and then picture I wanted to go to was, all right, so the second picture. This is a great example. Oh, that's not what I wanted to click. Okay, so 
you'll see right here how I sh it shows the second picture it actually captures only grabs script six pictures, and those were 0, 1, 2, 3, and C. So 0, 1, 2, 3 is the top row, and C puts you about, yeah. Okay, so um, here's our first picture with lots and lots of lines on it. I'm going to try to get clean. Okay. And then here's our second picture. And you'll see the only things that have changed are this stuff up here. Um, and because of the way it draws the lines, we actually refresh the entire top. And you'll also notice some artifacting here. Um, it, in fact, did change this because it was starting to render the start menu. So there you get a good example about how it only does MPEG, does that kind of MPEG-like compression. Does anyone have any questions? I don't want to bore you all with technical details. Yes? Wait for the microphone. Oh God, this is going to be loud. If, uh, two questions. First question, if this is based on a Trojan, then couldn't the author of that Trojan or their assignee of copyright come after this, this company for damages due to the use of that Trojan without their authorization? Possibly. I mean, I imagine if you... <laughs> I think if you write a Trojan and then release it and then someone does something with it, I don't think you really want to admit that you wrote the original Trojan. <laughs> Especially because, I mean, it's not like Netbus was back orifice where, you know, CDC actually said, hey, you can use this for admin tools. And I, in fact, know sysadmin tools who still use back orifice, um, maybe because they're cheap bastards. But uh, I, I, Netbus was never, hey, this is a legitimate tool. I'm the one who wrote it. It, it was never like that. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, you said this uses the, uh, the GZIP compression library and it uses a GPL version of that. If this were using a GPL library, then that w wouldn't that make I'm the sorry, finished uh, product? I, I misspoke. Uh, it uses the Zlib compression library, which is Zlib. used by uh, right. GZIP okay. and other people. And that actually is not um, uh, GZIP, or excuse me, it is not, um, not GPL. GPL. It's under something called the Zlib license, which is basically, here's a constant string and as long as this constant string remains in the final binary, you can do whatever the hell you want to do with it. In fact, that's how I figured out they were using um, Zlib. As I'm, I'm sitting there looking at the file, and I'm looking at the SPT file, and you'll see a lot of these 789C hex things at the beginning of every, and I kept seeing them all over the place, and I'm just like, these are way too regular, and they're all, and I, I ended up having to read lots of RFCs, but 789C is actually the header of a, Zlibs uh, of a stream that has been compressed using Zlib, and then later I stumbled upon this actual string of text which says Z or you know deflate algorithm copyright some French guy 98 or 97, and then I'm like wait a minute, so that was fun. Any other questions? Yes. Hey for the mic. Oh man, this is slow. I will dance. Two questions. Um, is the company that developed SpectreSoft, is it still actively developing it? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And secondly, have you received any legal threats? No, no, I haven't. Hence, hence that nice little legal disclaimer. This is written for interoperability only. I, I actually, so the name of the software, oh, thank you. The name of the software that uh, is up on SourceForge, and it's actually, I haven't moved it to SourceForge. I've been so busy with Stripe Snoop, but it's still on the yak net site. It's called Phasmatis, which is Latin for Spectre. And um, I wrote it simply because if you do in fact legitimately use this software as a system admin, good lord, why are you using a Windows box for, you know, system admitting these things? I thought it would be neat for um, some type of, so let's say, let's say, you know, you're Delta, right? I'm, I'm from Atlanta and Hartsfield, they have all these little fun kiosks. Let's say you wanted to see, you know, for usability studies or whatever, you decide to record what people were doing on the kiosk. So you could see, you know, what part of the UI people seem to like scratch their heads at, not really understand. I mean, how many people who are going to catch a flight going to sit there and fill out a survey? So you just monitor what they do. Um, I could see a leg legitimate use for Spectre of every night you just mount those drives with Samba, you pull the SPT files, and then you want to look at them. Basically, I want to try to get them into a form on a, on a Unix box that you could use Unix-like tools. In fact, the latest version of uh, Phasmatis has XML export. So it's like, nah, screw that crazy SPT file, dump this to XML, and it's a lot easier to trade, a lot easier to modify. Uh, and I've also written something that'll take XML and put it back into SPT. Um, 
so I, I, I kind of market it on the, on the Phasmatist website as you know, hey, first of all, I hate the company, but if you have to use it, this at least lets you use it on different platforms. Um, it's not proprietary, uh, it's extendable, so if they change their file format, I mean, if I'm an administrator and I want to, uh, there's no reason for me to pay ass loads of money for, for something that's using Zlib. You're, you're decompressing images and showing them to me. I mean, you're Photoshopped with some compression on you. Now, granted, it's got some interesting reporting capabilities, but I said, you know what, it, it would be nice if there was an open source tool that did this, and I hate the company. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, come on, my talk was that boring, or was I that, you know, like, thorough? I can't tell. Thorough? Yes. Wait for the mic. See, uh, I'll get it eventually, by the way, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I don't <laughs> have two questions, I have one. Okay. Um, I, I just want to clarify, because I'm a little confused as far as the file size of that SPT file. I as it goes on and on, I mean, is, are we talking about just the examples that you've given us, or one, or does it somehow cut itself off and start it, writing to multiple files? I imagine, well, it has the ability to say, whenever you stop Spectre, it goes ahead and writes that SPT file to disk. So theoretically, if a kiosk was running for a week or even a month, you're talking about a gigantic file buildup? Well, I have a feeling that Spectre probably has some internal cutoff that says, if an STP file has gotten more than, say, 20 megs, chop it. I mean, look, we pulled 53 megs of screen captures out of a one meg file. So imagine how incredibly ginormous that would be. And plus, I set the write to disk at every, uh, every three seconds, not 30, I said earlier. So I was writing every three disk, and that was three minutes writing every second. Uh, it has inactivity timers. It has some stuff to help it kind of preserve um, disk space. Um, when you close Spectre, writes the SBT file. Um, when you change the screen size, writes the SPT file. And that's because in the header, it has the screen dimensions and the uh, resolution. Um, interestingly enough, if you set Spectre to capture at, say, like 24 bits per pixel, but you change and it's capturing, and then you change the pixel size down to be, you know, say, 8 bits per pixel, Spectre is actually still capturing at 24 bits per pixel, which I think is kind of inefficient. I mean, that's three times more than what you need. They're, they should have done better than that. But I mean, not like I can fault them. I mean, good lord, the program is pretty damn cool. Um, uh, especially if you're, you know, in a database into um, structured program design file formats, which I've been doing a lot with s um, Stripe Snoop recently. Um, it's really impressive they managed to get so much data into one file. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, very much. Okay, cool. All right, I think there's a guy over there that has one. Uh, oh, I, just another little thing. I'm going to be setting up a Coke machine. How many people here were at Interzone in Atlanta? Okay, good. But you, but we like Freaknik better. We like Freaknik better. <laughs> um, there was a Coke machine there that I built that, that has a vending swipe thing on it. I'm going to be setting that up maybe tonight, probably running all day tomorrow. It will be running and let you read what's on cards. Um, it will display it, and then it will also, if if Stripe Snoop doesn't know what that type of card is, it should prompt you to say, hey, give me some information and just take your time, please, and submit that. Check what you're submitting to me at, at um, Interzone. I had like five people's social security numbers from like student IDs and such, um, but I could use some help getting more information for that. You had a question. Yeah, um, how do you reconcile, th I mean, it seems like you're, you've said that uh, your motivating force in doing this is the, your dislike of Spectrosoft. Um, how do you reconcile that with the possibility that what you're doing might actually turn into a tool to make it more useful and more productive in more environments? Saying that on a website makes it a lot less likely for a judge to think I'm a punk-ass kid. <laughs> <laughs> I, as, as Decius told me uh, a week ago, I, I was... So, Make Magazine... Oh, again, I have to pimp some stuff. Make Magazine is coming out. Uh, O'Reilly's doing a new do-it-yourself, and I have an article in there. It's like 10 pages long, all about Magstripe stuff. So please pick that up. Um, anyway, I, I was thinking of a real cool way to have like, so all of you, I'm sure, have data that you wouldn't like to have, you know, be exposed, set, let's say. So I was thinking about taking like an external hard drive, you know, because USB drives are so cheap, and sticking some thermite on the top of it, and, you know, having a nice little USB chipset. I've been playing with those. So if you don't enter in a right key combination or something before you access the device, it destructs. And uh, <laughs> Tom, I'm actually going to do this. So, so Tom looked at me, and I guess his statement kind of also applies to, you know, um, my spasmatist here. He just looks at me and goes, 
there is no legitimate use for this technology. <laughs> so hopefully by, you know, kind of saying, I mean, I don't like it, but it's GPL code. People can do with it what they want. And this is offering some things that you can do with it. I mean, the fact that um, Spectre is completely negating a, um, a, a growing part of how businesses run their infrastructure on Linux servers, um, this is an alternative they can use. I'm actually surprised they don't, considering how easy it, is, it, easy it was to port their software. Well, reverse engineer it, then port it. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Oh, yes. Wait for the mic. Someone get that over to Ilanka. Uh oh. No, I think it's on. Oh, just talk. Oh, no, I'll flip it. Sorry, I lied. Fi okay, yeah. finding, finding the, the DLLs is really cool. Um, but are there any, have you played with any of the utilities like Spybot S and D? Will it track down Spectre or are there any of the other? The I, I haven't there? looked at that because I don't want to do, you know, I'm not going to load this into soft dice. I mean, there is, I don't want them to like completely get pissed at me. I, I basically have tried to confine all of my stuff to, hey, how does this thing load? How does it hook it? And how can I kill it? I, it, it would be, I'm walking a pretty damn thin line if I'm actually looking how their program does, how it creates an SPT file when I'm also creating uh, essentially a program that will also create and read SPT files. I mean, I've pretty much been able to figure out what they've been able to do by just looking at the SPT file. Um, and so uh, I'm not going to even touch their executables. Just because, uh, you know, it's, it's way too gray area for me. Yes. Oh, I, I'm sorry, Lanka, did you have another question? Okay. I think it's still on. You uh, may have covered this earlier. I missed the first part of your talk, but it, is there, is it really hidden from the user? I mean, if can you, do you have full access? No, you don't have computer? any access at all. It's not only, even if Spectre is not running in stealth mode, it's still password protected. Uh, and again, there was, there was no reason for me to, to try to crack the password because, I, again, I'm kind of drawing the line at here's their executable, and if I'm only screwing with the file format, they're a lot less likely to come after me. So even if the computer's not protected in any other way, if you pull up, like, the, the task manager, can you see the process running no, and just you kill can't. it? No, it, it okay. uses DLLs, it hooks Explorer, right. and then every other process that spawns, it hooks that too. So it's capturing your key events uh, it's capturing the repaint for the Windows, uh, the GDI. The GUI that uh, you're showing, is that available to the admin on every box that Spectre's running on? Yes. Uh, they do not have a remote client, as near as I can tell, which that's another great thing about mine. Not that I'm trying to say use this for it, but I mean, you could pull the SPT files and then run them locally. Right now, uh, Spectre doesn't offer any way for you to take an SBT file and like, it, it offers basically no management. I mean, that's why I had to make XML files just so I could help keep track of them because I've got like 200 freaking SBT files and I'm trying to keep track of what's with what. Um, they really kind of missed the boat on trying to deploy this in any great extent and manage it. I mean, there should be, uh, first of all, Spectre should be pushing these things to a server um, uh, or have some type of mechanism to push them. Uh, there should be some type of, of, you know, hierarchical, you know, filing system database on some type of server where you can manage these things, um, and there isn't. Uh, so that that GUI is there uh, for uh, Spectre. It's oh, I, I should have said this earlier. Uh, it's Control Shift S will pop up a little window that says Enter a password. Or if Spectre's running in non-stealth mode, you'll see that little square at the bottom. Double click on that; it'll prompt you for a password as well. Um, so, and if anyone wants to play with this, uh, I, I misquoted the price earlier. It's not 50 bucks. Spectre is actually 149 if you buy it online. If you buy it online, it's 199 if you buy it retail. So they're making quite a killing off this. And there is uh, Spectre 1 2 floating around. Um, and there also is a serial number floating in like alt.2600. And it's a complete coincidence that I happen to be using 1 2 2. Uh, no, seriously, I did. I did go out and shell out the money, and I'm I'm currently working with the latest version, at least as of June. Uh, I have you have another questions. one still. Um, I know that eBlaster, you can uh, you can create a package, send it out as an executable to somebody, they run it, and 
um, it will report, you know, send you emails, whatever you want, okay. uh, of what their activity is, and that control shift S function is not available on their box. So, okay, so that's, that Could very much sounds that? almost like kind of a <laughs> nice little fun message in a bottle like Netbus. I'll, I'll try to. Is it possible that, that you could have Spectre on your box and you could not be able to access it? The, the latest version I have seen, uh, I did not notice that feature, but like I said, I haven't, I haven't really looked at it in depth. I bought it in June, and I looked at it for about a week before I just got distracted with school and research. Um, the eBlaster, seeing as how it's more of kind of a light version, it would make sense you could almost, so, so Spectre has a configuration menu where you can configure what screenshots, what resolution, what bit depth, how often, you know, key logs, all that other stuff, what exactly you want to capture. So it sounds very much like you can kind of pre-configure and, ex you know, set up the configuration file ahead of time, send it as a nice little package to a user who runs it, and then it basically, I don't know whether it probably, I, I haven't messed with eBlaster, but since it's the same company, I imagine it's some type of small daemon that runs doing the same type of collection, and it's probably just uh, back, uh, packaging itself up, those SPT files and just sending them. Does anyone have any other questions? I see one over here. Okay, let me, last question. Last question. Thank you, Dolan. That guy right there. No. Okay. So if this thing is uh, hooking in through explorer.exe, uh, I don't know. I heard there's something about a, a black box uh, for Windows, uh, or Window Manager okay. uh, for Windows. Theoretically, if you could kill uh, explorer.exe and have a different Window Manager running in Windows, as to why you would do that, I don't know. But just say for theory's sake, would that kill Spectre? Well, yeah. I mean, Spectre wouldn't. Wouldn't. Pr Spectre probably doesn't know what type of. Um, Okay, if it's a window manager for Windows, it probably has to have some function compatibility. So, you know, when Excel, you know, calls the repaint, calls the move, calls the different um, GDI events, that it can respond. So it should be able to hook those same functions. Um, but is it looking for specifically explorer.exe? I have just no for idea. I imagine it's looking for explorer.exe. If they were smart, they would have gone. I don't think they use config I and I for the same more, but back in the day, even through Win98 and ME, you could. Uh, specify a different shell other than Explorer EXE. I know people who did like um, car MP3 players and stuff yeah. who decided to use Windows um, would just change their shell to be Winamp, um, which would still bring up your know your mouse events. Um, I still think, I mean, Explorer is two parts, right? You've got the kernel, but Explorer also kind of handles icon placement, resize. I mean, it, it does everything. Um, in addition to being a file manager slash Internet Explorer slash virus propagator. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you guys very much. I always love talking here at Freak Nick. Um, come uh, yak.net slash acidus. Uh, I'm going to be here all the weekend, so come talk with me if you want to see some Magstripe stuff or you want to learn more about this. So thanks again. <laughs>